Stand-up comedian Marty Vids started a successful mortgage-broking business, sold it, moved to paradise, had a breakdown, moved away from paradise, started another one, moved back to paradise. And he's here to tell the story, like literally here on this show to share his story. Hashtag inspirational. Oh, yes, it is very inspirational. Before we get stuck into episode 429 of the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show, the Marketing Gold is made possible thanks to American Express and Design Crowd. Now, Design Crowd, you're going to love. If you haven't used them already, I know many of you have. They are the world's number one custom design marketplace where you get access to 550,000 designers for the perfect design every time. And you can get 100 bucks off your brief at designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo. And a big thanks to American Express who recognize that small businesses have many needs. Whether your need is extended cash flow or rewards points so you can go on a holiday, there is an American Express business card design specifically to meet your need. To find the best card for your beautiful business, Google Amex Business. That is Amex Business. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And Welcome back to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. I am your host, Timbo Reed. You, infinitely more importantly, are a motivated business owner and you are ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Guess what? Big show today. <laughs> Stand-up comedian and serial entrepreneur Marty Vids shares how he's used humour to build two, not one, two successful mortgage-broking businesses and manage his way through a nervous breakdown. Great story, great learnings. Another motivated listener shares a few marketing strategies that's working for them in the Monster Prize draw. This week's advertising jingle of the week is Light on the Fizz, so you can slam it down fast. Remember that one. And I'm going to let you know who's joining me on the show in the coming weeks. As per usual, team, there is marketing, G-O-L-D, dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Got some really solid interviews coming up in the weeks ahead, including a chat with a fellow who's turned two crazy adventures into a business that he absolutely loves. And when I say crazy, I mean crazy. (laughs) This bloke's paddled with a mate from Australia to New Zealand. That is 3,318 kilometres, in case you're wondering. (laughs) And he's walked unsupported with the same mate from the edge of Antarctica to the South Pole and back again. That was just a lazy 2,275 kilometres. What was he thinking? That is coming up next week. Massive business learnings in there, of course. But right now, let's meet Marty Vids, who cut his teeth, cut his business teeth, working in the family milk bar. Went on to become a successful stand-up comedian, started two people-centric mortgage-broking businesses turning over a million bucks a year with 40% margins and had a breakdown along the way. It's a pretty honest account of Marty's business journey, let me tell you. But don't worry, this is a very upbeat chat with a bloke who has cleverly applied all his learnings from his stand-up comedy days to running successful small businesses. So pen and paper at the ready team, you are about to be given a masterclass in growing a business that would be loved by both staff and customers and suppliers. I started off by asking Marty about the time his career teacher advised him he was destined to become a butcher. Yeah, that was my careers teacher in year 10 because uh, I wasn't doing that well at school, Tib. I uh, 
I enjoyed the sports and I enjoyed drama. But I remember being hauled into the careers room and he said, gee, Marty, uh, I think you uh, better consider being a butcher given your grades. And I had different visions, Tim. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> he, he had showcased me into this box and... Uh, it was heartbreaking. I remember going home and crying. Really? Yeah. There's not, nothing wrong with being a butcher, but I, clearly you had uh, higher expectations of yourself. Yeah, and I think it sort of gave me the first impression of how people viewed me. Like, I'd never considered uh, it up until that point, but the fact that he thought that that was all that I was capable of yes. was, was pretty damning, and, and my ego kicked up and said, you know, Partly I'll show you on your 50 grand salary. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a, it's a funny feeling. Like sometimes those moments when people say those things are, feel horrendous, but they're the best moments. Yes. Yeah, and well, you've been quoted as saying when no one believes in you, you have no choice but to believe in yourself. I think that's important. Easy, easily said than done. Well, I failed HSC twice. Well done. Yeah. Unless I, you didn't fail three times. You well, go back for a third? No, because I was only there for the social aspect and could I thought I. I could possibly get the Guinness Book of Records if I go back a third time. Yes. But it was, yeah, it was very surreal because I didn't know until a couple of years ago I have, I have a bit of a learning disability and it was only through my son I'd picked that up. Really? Just but, a couple of years ago? Yeah, just a couple of years ago because I could read but what was happening is my, my vision would always veer off the page. So unless it was really relevant... It would, took so much strength just to read books and yet numbers, no problem. No problem. So it was quite bizarre. But I never thought anything about it until recently when I was going Do, through Does a it few matter? Tests. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough. Like you go, oh, there must be something wrong with me. And when you get to the point where everyone starts to judge you like that, you have no choice. You, right. you have to believe in yourself. So and it that's, gave that you some great surety thing. that, hey, okay, well, there's something amiss, but... It doesn't matter. Everything's working okay. Life's been pretty good. You've started and sold two good businesses, so... uh... Yeah, and I think in some ways that um, feeling of not being good enough in some way was actually a real fuel to go, you know what, I'm not taking this. This is uh, not how it's going to end. Yes. You know, and I have no disrespect to butchers. I eat meat, I like meat, and <laughs> and I like it cut well. But it's it's just one of those things where I go, no, if that's how people are seeing me, there's something has to change here. And, and from that day forward, I went about changing that. So back then, you were going through school. Your mum and dad owned a milk bar. Yeah, in, back in, in the 80s. Uh, back in the 80s. Good days to own a milk bar. Love the 80s. You worked in that milk bar. What did you learn from doing that? Yeah, started work at the age of seven and the milk bar was fantastic because ethnic people in the 80s, you know, really ran milk bars yes. or pizza shops. That was our gig, <laughs> right? And you're Croatian? Croatian background, German, Polish, so milk bar just fitted the bill. Right in the middle. Beautifully. But Dad did something very clever with me. He allowed me to run the bread stand and this was brilliant for business because I would get the profits at the end of the day of whatever sold on the bread. So at a very early age, I started to pick up business techniques and doing things like when George came from across the road, he'd come into the milk bar, I knew which loaf of bread he wanted and I'd put his milk out as well and he'd give me a tip. Nice. And I go, so people didn't only want product, they wanted to feel special. And that was, I picked that up very early on. You helped the tip top man bring the bread in and he threw in an extra couple of loaves. That means, you know, a couple of more video games. Space Invaders back in the oh, 80s. Oh, hello. You know, when rainbows yes. were black and white, Tim. You remember? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Now, um, you then went on and launched your stand-up comedy career. This fascinates me because I'm a huge believer that uh, A, comedy is necessary in business and B, the disciplines of stand-up comedy are absolutely applicable to business. We're going to talk about that later. Why did you, why did you start a stand-up comedy career at the age of 16, weren't you? Yeah, 16. It was 88 I did my first gig. And it came out of that careers teacher interview and I loved Robin Williams. Good morning, Vietnam, I saw it. And we were going through some difficult times and I just remember watching that and I thought, comedy makes it better. You know, Good Morning Vietnam to me and Robin Williams was just my godsend. And from that day forward, I just loved it. Billy Connolly, Richard Pryor, um, Robin Williams. What that made was you my do life. it? Yeah, I was, I was very introverted socially, but I was extroverted within the family. Ah. And what happened was doing stand-up, 
allowed me to be extroverted everywhere. But it was courageous. I remember being at the Star and Garda first gig. I'd practised it. No one moved. Not, not only didn't laugh, they didn't move, <laughs> right? It was just horrific. If if you ever see just people staring blankly back at you, yeah. and that's why they call it you die in comedy. Yes. Because it is, it is death warmed up. It prepares you. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes. and Jim Owen came up to me, because I'd been doing well at drama, Jim Owen came up to me, who's an Australian comic, and he said, oh, look, you performed it well. And that was enough hope to get me to the second Beautiful. gig. You've had a an interesting childhood at the age of between 16 and 19. You then lived in a caravan with your dad, having separated from his mum, from his wife, your mum, and you said you had to shower in some toy shower. And from that moment you learnt, I think you said... Uh, you learn to strive for a comfortable life ever since. Yeah, it, two things are really good out of that. Coming out of the divorce, I decided to go and live with Dad and he was still building a house, what seemed like, for the next five years. But um, we lived in this caravan, slept on a foam mattress and in the middle of winter in the Yarra Valley, it's like sometimes minus two degrees and that toy shower, you put the hose in the end of it and it's just freezing and you've got to get back and put the gas on the caravan just so you don't get hypothermia. But, But it did teach me, it did make me look for comfort. I'm going... Look, I can't have this. And and don't get me wrong, Tim, I lived a pretty good, you know, working class sure. life. Like my parents never let me without food and it, it was fine. But that period was really, really difficult because there was an adjustment for the whole family. But what it taught me was that I have to change this. Careers teacher told me, be a butcher. You know, I'm in this caravan, I'm freezing. I had to hitchhike to go to tennis. I had to hitchhike to get anywhere, really, because I didn't have any money and I was too young to drive a car. But, gee, it made me resilient and it made me really resourceful. It made me ask big questions at an early age to go, you know, is this it? You finally escaped the cubicle in 2000 to start your first small business, which is a mortgage broking business. Yeah. Why'd you do that? Well, I gave up on my dream of comedy. Right, so that, ne- never do that. That was so dumb, Tim. It was so dumb, and I was—I remember I was earning about forty grand a year because you know it was I was started to run stand-up comedy nights in the Yarra Valley and having fun doing that. But I was—I was listening to the criticism. I was listening to the things that were wrong about me. Oh, you said that joke last week. Yeah, but that person didn't hear it. You know, it's like they don't hear it for the next ten years. You got new audience all the time. <laughs> yeah, but but what I did, I thought. The comedians were interesting. They were very kind because they kept me out of the drug culture mm-hmm. because I was so young. They were really encouraging. But after 12, I said, Marty, you better go home and I'll be on but the... But why, why did you, you... You have a comfortable job in Westpac. Were you bored off your tree? And, or were you going to start... I suppose you're from a family of small business owners. Yeah. So it wasn't a big leap. What did you see when you're sitting in the mahogany office of Westpac that you thought, oh, hang on, I can do this better? Uh, definitely in regards to the attitude of the bank. In what, what I was seeing was when you did well in the bank, you were actually punished because they'd always come back to you. Instead of going to the poor performer, they'd always come back to you and go, have you got more deals? Have you got more deals? And then if you gave a great rate to the client, they would say you could have sold them this product that was higher, which would have been a better return on investment for us. But what they didn't see was by looking after the client, actually looking after the client, that client would then tell their friends and tell Mm. their friends and it was a momentum build. But because the corporate world's so transactional Mm -hmm. and it's the next, you know, it's the next reporting season is all that matters and the shareholder. And so philosophically I, I saw it as a great training ground, met some wonderful people in there. I thought it was the best business course you could ever do and get paid for it. And then I thought in 2000 when mortgage broking came out, I thought, oh, we can empower the client. We can actually choose the best products from the best banks and use competitive tension and represent the client. I'm going, this is really good. I'm going, does anyone know about this? And I I spoke to a business partner who was also out of the Yarra Valley, Craig Parkins, who's still a good friend of mine, and I said, there's something in this. There's, there really is. And we can get on the front of the wave. And that was... The, he was into it? 
Yeah, yeah, he was because, uh, you know, so many hours and we can't take lunch breaks. I admire people. I was speaking to Andrew Banks from Shark Tank on last week's episode and he too had a bloke come into his office in 1996 and he's been running Morgan and Banks, a big recruitment company, and this bloke came into his office and said, there's this thing coming called the internet and you'll be able to put all the job applicants online. And Andrew, that, that was right, you know, right at the forefront of the wave. And Andrew had the foresight to kind of trust this guy. Didn't really know what he was talking about. Yeah. And likewise you, you know, the people at the front of the wave, you've got some insight, you've got some kind of sixth sense because it would take some courage to, you know, leave your corporate existence because comfortable and maybe as frustrating as it was and back a horse that has never run before. Well, do you, you know how I got criticised for comedy? Oh, my goodness. You're, <laughs> you're 28, you've got this, you know... Who, who's saying this? Your job. Oh, friends. Friends and family. Yeah, friends, friends. Everyone's was got good. an opinion. Dad has a, has a go. Have, have a go, have a go. But he was good. But that was just amazing, that, that feeling of... But I knew that the pull towards it was stronger than to stay there. And I had a couple of people say to me, Marty, you just... I don't know what it is, but you don't belong in a cubicle. Mm. You know, I had a couple of people say that and I also had a mentor say to me, you know, don't finish seventh in life by floating. You know, have have a crack and back yourself. You, you're not meant to be here. Beautiful. So it's for all that rah-rah in the negative sense, it's those mentors that say the right things at the right time that you run with. And, and it did take a lot of courage and for the first six months we were sitting there going, well, look, probably the first three months, we're going, why isn't the phone ringing? And then we realised we had to go and make it happen because yeah. uh, we'd been so busy for so long in the bank. And, uh, well, well and that how, was did, great. how did you make the phone ring? Because uh, to, in, the deep, in my brief to you prior to coming on air, you said that um, you couldn't compete on marketing. Banks had much deeper pockets to sell their mortgages uh, and advertise and get the word out. You competed on story. What do you mean by that? Well, we had to position ourselves well because in 2000 people thought you went to brokers mortgage brokers when you couldn't get money Uh so that was the philosophy up until about 2003 so what we had to show we had to demonstrate value so we had to sit with people you had an an education role to play it was education marketing Mm. and we had to document our brilliance. So our marketing wasn't on the back end. You had to document your brilliance. That's what we I had like to that. do. That's what we said. We're going, people aren't going to guess what we do. We have to document our brilliance and we have to do the work up front and utilise our time to show people the benefit of utilising us. We had to educate a new industry. And that so how was... how did you do that? Well, what we did was we sat in front of accountants. We thought, what was the first 20 people we could sit in front of? That's what we had to do and that's what we did and we showed them the loan they were on because everyone was back on standard variable rates at that time. You get a one-year great rate (laughs) and then they'd blow it out and, you know, margins were great for the bank. We showed them they could get professional packages and then we compared them and we said, look, you can save $90,000 here and eight years off your loan by doing three simple steps. They're going, you're kidding me. Okay, my bank doesn't tell me this. As soon as I hear that, I go, that's yeah. wonderful. I yeah, go, that's, yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. And then we document it. Then we document it so they can see it. And still in the early days, they'd go, well, why don't I just go and take this to the bank? And, you know, because we're still up against uh, fear. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, you could do that. But then you wouldn't be getting this advice for the long term. Mm-hmm. We're here for you for the next 15 years. Bank managers change every six months, every four months. Mm. Yeah, which is a great marketing lesson in itself. And every all business owners should be asking themselves, how can I what pain points are my customers and prospects got and how can I quickly remove them? That's right. And in fact turn them into something that are in, is an enjoyable experience. And that's the big point of difference. Let's go back to stand up comedy, Marty, and what you learned, because there's a number of things that you applied in this first business, which by the way was called Mortgage First. Does it still exist? Um, I'm not sure if it still exists. Right. Uh, WHK bought them out. I knew it was around for about five years. You say five WHK years. as if we all know who they are. Yeah, they're a publicly okay. listed company. So, right. So they, um, they well, come in. Yeah. You talk, okay, let's go through these learnings. Audience responsiveness. Explain that concept and how it applied from your comedy days. 
Hey, this is Timbo Reid, and you are listening to the award-winning small business Big Marketing Show. And the other voice is stand-up comedian turned successful mortgage broker, Marty Vids, who very shortly is going to explain how his stand-up comedy days taught him how to create a business people loved. This show is made possible thanks to American Express Business Explorer credit card. A card that lets your business expenses reward you. I asked Amex member Chris Gray, CEO of property buying business Your Empire, how he benefits from using his Amex. I use Amex for the whole of my business. Literally every single thing I pay in my business, even down to effectively my staff or my contractors and my rent at home, everything goes on the Amex card. Because with Amex, you get the most points for your dollar spent. And I convert those points into frequent flyer rewards points. I fly 10 or 15 times a year, only business and first class, including those beautiful A380 suites you get on Singapore Airlines where you get your own bedroom. And I fly for free. I don't pay for a single flight. But it's not all upside. Or is it? So I've got a, I've still got a million points because I spend so much money in my business. I've then got to pre-plan 10 trips for next year of where do I want to go? I need to find excuses to go to different countries. <laughs> this is a massive first world problem, Chris. It is, but I'm willing to put up with it. So there's, there's very few people that can, uh, can force themselves through the pain barrier, but I'm willing to do it. I've trained myself. <laughs> New American Express card members who apply and spend $3,000 in the first three months from the card approval date receive a bonus 100,000 membership rewards points. Ah, uh, you got to love it when your business expenses reward you. Search Amex Business to find out how. New American Express card members only. Offer ends November 30, 2017. Terms and conditions apply. Ha! I always wanted to do that. Let's go back to stand-up comedy, Marty, and what you learned because there's a number of things that you applied in this first business, which, by the way, was called Mortgage First. Does it still exist? Um, I'm not sure if it still exists. Right. Uh, WHK bought them out. I knew it was around for about five years. You say WHK years. as if we all know who they are. Yeah, they're a all publicly can. listed company. So, right. So they, um, they well, come in. Yeah. You talk, okay, let's go through these learnings. Audience responsiveness. Explain that concept and how it applied from your comedy days. Well, in comedy, you would always be assessing the audience's reaction to your, to your comedy. And if it wasn't working well, you had to respond very quickly. <laughs> and that's the same in business. You're looking at what's the response of your client. And what we had to be careful of was content overload as well. So too much information is actually confusing. So we always had to deliver what did the client want. That was what we'd always ask. So audience responsiveness in that situation was fantastic because we could, again, totally told them what we thought was fantastic or we could listen to what they want and deliver that and just add little value adds to them as we went incrementally along the journey. But that responsiveness was was really, really good in comedy because if you're going poorly... Oh, well, you've it's, got it's a, real time. It's real time. <laughs> when someone's asking a question, you're responding directly to that question and that's really key. Just ensure that they're happy with the answer because once that client is gone, they could be gone forever if you haven't really catered to mm. their needs. And for us, being a word-of-mouth business... That was our whole business. It was one yeah. client led to two, well, led to three. Well, who, who doesn't want to be responded to as a, as, a, as a human being? So I like that. Number one learning from stand-up comedy, audience responsive. Next one, handle criticism. It's a really good one because of the fact that in comedy, <laughs> you're trying to get the first person to laugh, right? Yeah. You're always going to have... 10, 15% of the audience that absolutely hates your guts. Yeah. Doesn't get you. And then there's the haggler. The heckler. heckler. The, the heckler. And I've got a lot of responses, but none I could say on this <laughs> wonderful show, Tim. Oh, but I love a good heckler this response. Will be, this will be uh, off, <laughs> off uh, sound check. But, uh, but, yeah, that that was the thing. And then the first person, get the first person laughing, and what you're looking for is momentum. And as soon as you've got 51% of that audience, you've got the audience. 
And so many people think that, oh, I've got to have everyone like me or mm. else. They always remember the one person out of 30 yes. that didn't like them and harp on that. Yeah. You don't have to be at 100% on everything. You have to do the best you can uh. in that situation and it's amazing. Your brilliance can be focusing on your tribe. If the 10% of people in comedy absolutely love you of that night, at, of that night they start to follow you. That becomes your tribe. Play to the light, Tim. Now, think about this as clients. Mm -hmm. If I love those clients that, you know, that are really responding to our business and they're referring people, I'm getting similar clients. Right. Now, can I I respond to the clients outside of that? Absolutely. But do you want to work with them? Probably not. Maybe not. You know, you got it. Then you have the choice. Then mm. you have the choice. But I found that to be really great to build momentum in the right direction, which is that niche customer base that you want. As you're building this uh, business, Marty, the fir- your first small business, are you actively reflecting on your stand-up days, or is it just kind of part of your DNA that you felt it's easy to look back now and go, "Oh, I can see what I was doing there." Yeah, it's a great question, and. That lightheartedness came through. It always came through. Mm. It was always in the innovation, the way I dealt with challenge. And if people had a difficult situation, we'd always smile about it first. And as soon as you got them out of that discomfort of being angry and miserable, there's a way through. And I could see the way I set up team meetings. It would always be jovial. There would always be proactiveness. Like we always thought about what could we bring to the table that helped each other? It was very collaborative. And I thought, but those stand-up days, even in doing corporate speaking and talking to various different investors and things, it helped me so much, Tim, so much. It's not enough humour in business. This is what I'm thinking as you're talking. We are dying from seriousness out there. You talk about mental health issues. My goodness, you know, Grab a Coke and have a laugh. I mean... Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, I thought that's what you no, meant. I'm only addicted to prescription glasses, so <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the shortest way to a laugh. What does that... How does that apply to business? Well, in comedy, as we know, we're looking to take out the non-essentials to get to the punchline. Same as business. What is the direct route to get to the result? And that is, that is an absolute key to, again, the simplification and amplification of business. If you simplify one plate spinning well, you amplify that. You know, you don't have 56 different products. That's not our gig anyway. You do one thing exceptionally well and that creates the platform. But that is that taking out the non-essentials, what don't we need to be focusing on is just as important as what we need to be focusing on. If you want to see that in real life action, <clears throat> Seinfeld has done a video. It's about a five minute video. He did it for the New York Times where he, with his yellow legal pad, he deconstructed a joke and it was a joke about Pop-Tarts and it's brilliant because it starts ac- across, I think it spreads across two or three pages, the writing of this gag. And the amount of edits and the amount of crossing out and the, you know, deleting words, deleting verbs, deleting adjectives, deleting as much as you can, replacing a series of words with one word. I mean, and he said this joke took him two years to construct purely through that process. And this is the thing. We had we had 22 steps in our mortgage processing system that we had created out of relevancy of doing it. Now, Some people have 69, some people have 80 steps, they don't even realise it. But we had condensed it into the biggest impact points within the business that we knew worked. Brilliant. And that's... Did you give it a name? No, we didn't really. It was just a little sort of thing in the back of your minds. Everyone followed it. We had it written down, Mm -hmm. but it was the process of what we did. These were the touch points. So everything was documented and everyone brought it to the table, but we got it down to 22 points and we do that time and time. Anyone could come into that business and follow those steps and that is from comedy. What an asset. So you've applied all this stand-up work to building uh, Mortgage First into a bit of an empire. Yep. And in 2007, you go, we're going to sell this. We've won a few awards. We're peaking. Look at us. We're funny guys. And you get the check of a lifetime. How was that? Surreal. Very surreal. Because I never had to have one of those toy showers again. 
<laughs> I was hoping you'd stop there by the time you'd started mortgage first. <laughs> you you put... are a bit on the nose though, Marty. You've got a bloody deodorant on or something? I thought I did spray, but anyway, <laughs> sorry. But, uh, it, yeah, look, it, it was a surreal experience because, you know, I'd never seen that much money before in my life. I don't think I'd lent a loan out that big. Do you want to so, tell us how much? Uh, well, it was 1.65. Brilliant. So, you know, for a little country guy. Country bloke. Grew up in a milk bar and, pretty, you know, it was going to be a butcher. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of dough. European background. I was pretty oh, – and I was proud. I was proud as punch. And it was um, – it's hard to describe it, but we went down to the bank and dropped off the cheque and the bank, bank manager was going, what do you do? And it was like, oh, same as what you do. <laughs> and it was like a, this, <laughs> this awful this awful thing for that guy because I yeah. knew he was thinking yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was like that – moment where you can enjoy your courage. Like that was the moment. You know when yeah. you say that courage to make that step when yes. you went out of the bank and you gave up the security, you weren't getting the fortnightly check anymore and everyone thought you were nuts. And I thought, wow, that was that, was that moment where I could enjoy that courage for the first time. How long did you enjoy the moment for? Uh, about two days. And then... <laughs> Really? <laughs> well, the the strange thing is, Tim, it was my whole identity. So we had been going pretty hard for a long time. Who's we? Well, Craig and I and the people within the business. And I love the people in the business. And it was just, it was so surreal to have it there and then it was gone. It was like you, that was your baby and it was, it was all over. People talk about getting the check and that was exciting, but... You can't ascertain, and this is unfortunately the lateral thinking, you can't ascertain the loss of that opportunity platform because when it's gone, you've got to start again. You lost your identity. Well, I did. You moved to Noosa, the best place in the whole of Australia, and you had a meltdown in, in the tropics. I did. I was in the most beautiful place in the world. And I got up one day and I couldn't move. It was just... Everything that I knew was gone and I felt like the 15-year-old before I discovered comedy. The same vulnerabilities, um, the same fears. I was emotional all of a sudden. I had time. Time with idle hands is not a good thing for me, Tim. It's <laughs> like I like, you know, I, I like to be doing. I'm a doer. And all of a sudden I felt vulnerable. So it wasn't the money didn't change that feeling when the identity was lost all of a sudden. And I had to ask better questions about who I am. I was 34 at the time. I'd have had a level of success, whatever that means. In my mind, it was only one step of the journey and you're only good as your last quarter, <laughs> as they say in football. Yep. So it was, uh, it was an interesting time. And to see myself go into that vulnerability it was, uh, yeah, it was time to make some major changes. And I'm guessing that you weren't, you, you, you seem to be a glass half full fella, uh, someone who's not, you know, um, not necessarily going to suffer from anxiety or depression to the level that you did. I mean, you said you didn't get out of bed for two months. Yeah, well, it felt So that came way. out of nowhere, yeah. must have come out of nowhere. It, it was incremental over about four months, but I didn't see it happening and doctors were sort of questioning me on it going you know, what are you up to? <laughs> the leading questions on the from coke, doctors. Coke, too much yeah. coke, how Coca-Cola. Long, how long have you been out of the business for? Oh, what are you doing up here? Yeah. All these leading questions. Yeah, right. go, I'm fine, I'm fine. My resilience, you know, my... But, but what I was doing with that first business was really validating myself. I needed that to feel good, you know, because I'd copped that criticism early on and this was the learnings that I picked up a little bit later on, but I needed to prove myself to myself, but also to everyone else in that business. And that comes with a level of anger. That comes mm. with a level of driving beyond your body, beyond your mind, and pushing yourself to the limits. And when all of a sudden the valve is released, it's like, oh, it's, it's like first there's relief and then you go, well, what is there? And you go, oh, I've been busy for a reason. And they were the types of things I needed to address personally. Mm. And it was scary. Like, my wife had never seen me like that. Um, people hadn't seen me like that. And, and I didn't want to tell anyone. Cause so I'm, how did you end up getting out of bed and getting on with life? I remember I woke up one day and I said, um, that's it. 
because they wanted to put me on antidepressants at the time. And I'm going, well, I don't feel depressed. My mind's still working here. Um, I'm just physically tired. So what I, what I did was I started walking. Just walk, did, just went Forrest Gump on the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> the basics. I didn't want to listen yeah. to the doctors, you yeah. know. I just thought, yeah. I, thought, I, I just started walking and that was, um, yeah, that, that was how it started. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to make this count. This is not where it ends. And the walking really helped me. It, it got my body moving, got my mind moving. I started to eat better. I gave up alcohol, uh, stopped drinking. Uh, there was lots of things that I... All the basics. I went to Vipassana, which is a 10-day noble silence thing. That'll blow your mind if you ever do that. I have Um, done it. I I don't know if it's Vipassana, but I have done a silence retreat. 10 days I was in there and and I realised every thought manifested in my body. I felt every thought in my body and after three days I wanted to pretend I had a tooth infection just so I could get out. I'm going, don't leave me with my mind in this place. What are you doing? And then after day five, day six, I had this beautiful kundalini energy and that that gave me... Isn't that the sexual en- energy motive? I don't know what I it is. I think it is. But, it's but, the uh, uh, between the legs type of energy. Is yeah, you're up and about, where? Well, not there. <laughs> But we did have a kid when... We did. <laughs> but it was five, after. five years later. What's his name? Kundalini? <laughs> That's a character in Mad Max too, by the way. It's, he's the lead, lead bikey. There you go. Oh, I love it. But, but that was... But it's, it's interesting you say that because we had Charlie five years later. I don't think... Yeah, you know, we had had... Um, we had had some unfortunate events with, with Conception, but um, I don't think we would have had Charlie... If I hadn't have made those changes and stopped drinking and be more mindful and did my acupuncture, like I created a life plan for myself, I took care yeah, of myself. I understand that because I, I love this. You know, you're you're a blokey bloke. You're Croatian, so I imagine your old man's quite a blokey bloke. And you yeah. know, uh, you've uh, you've gone and done a vipassana, you've done acupuncture, you've got your kundalini up and about. All sorts of things are going on. Uh, were you pushed into this? No, no. I knew I needed to do something and I didn't want to medicate. I just go... Good on you. I, I go, there's no way I'm going to do that. Meditate, there's... not medicate. Exactly. And I didn't want to drink anymore. I only did it for confidence in the first place. Never enjoyed it, but did it because socially it was good. And um... Do you used to have a drink before you went on stage to do your stand-up? Uh, early days, yes, and then once I got paid more, I did. No, because... Professional, I'm professional. Yeah, I also read somewhere where you said uh, you did a business call course called What Works, which saved your life. You said, yeah, but, statement. Yeah, because that came out of the. It was a week after the careers teacher had written me off, right? So I went in there. They basically said, "Oh, you can design the life you want in regards to professionally." And I thought, hang on a minute, I thought the thing was uni, high school. Mm. You know, there's a roadmap, isn't there? And they go, no, 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 you can create a business. And we'd been in small business, but that was the first time that I went through a process where I started to visualise things I wanted in life. So I ran a stand-up comedy night in the local area. You go through your breakdown, you come out of it, you move back to Melbourne and in 2009 you start a second mortgage broking business. You're back to, you know, ground zero. Yeah, because the, in 2008, before the GFC, like people thought we sold, we were geniuses, pure luck before the GFC. But coming out of the back of what I went through in Noosa, I could see businesses start shutting down. I could see the news agent being there 20 years, the butchers, ironically. Sorry to bring up <laughs> yeah. all my butcher Hello friends out there. Butchers, by the way. <laughs> but they closed down and I thought, gee, these are, these are good businesses that are going under. And it felt like you're on the path to somewhere that wasn't going to be good. And I was mentoring other businesses at that stage. And one thing I found with mentoring, I loved doing it, but I couldn't directly impact from the doing. I could advise, but I love the doing. And I thought, and people kept saying, how do I make the money? And I'm going, no, no, tell me, ask me, how do you build a great business? You know, how do you deliver Much something better question. beyond expectation? You know, it, it's like all these things that I was really passionate about, Tim, people were just discounting for the dollar. And, and I thought, you know what? It was grand final day, 2009, and footy always inspires me. Yeah. And I just, I was watching this Fortune 500 program and I thought, Mortgage 500. 
You know, it's progressive. <laughs> Indy 500. It says <laughs> what it does. Yeah. You know, mortgage is in the name. It's like yeah. mortgage first. Everyone thought we were mortgage choice. So this idea came simply from a name that you thought, oh, I like that. I reckon I could build a business around it. Moment of inspiration. And I had this vision of and seeing... You listen to it. ...the client. Yeah, you always... When you have that wisdom, you've always got to speak it out loud so you could hear it because otherwise you suppress it back down. Right. That's the that's the uh, the meditation talk. Except when you're on a Vipassana, Vipassana <laughs> silence retreat. What did you say? Well, don't say it. It's meant to be silent. <laughs> it's a silent retreat. Yeah. They shall not kill on that retreat, <laughs> as if you're coming in there with a gun. And, <laughs> and I stepped on a frog day two and killed it, so, you know, I'm going straight to hell, Tim. But in regards to... In regards to that, it was like I could see the client sitting with financial advisor, mortgage broker, a business lender, all in the boardroom, and I could see the colours. And I'm going, wow! It, it was like I was, I was searching. I don't like the chaos of not knowing what I'm doing. It always feels uncomfortable for me. But then it just all sparked in the name. I love the name. I love the progress in it. And then I thought... You could see it. Yeah, and then I thought lease 500. I thought business 500. Oh, I thought legal 500. My. I thought I could I could explain everything I'm doing with this number. Yeah. And it was like that moment where I go, Cole, pack up the truck. We're going. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's time to get back at the game. Is that your wife that you were referring to? Yeah, then? Cole. What did she say? She's going, I love the beach. <laughs> So I promise when we have a kid, we'll be back. We'll be back. Did she but, want to kill you? Ah, uh, very supportive. She is. She's Lisa. really supportive. I'm. I'm very fortunate with that mm. because, can you imagine living with me? <laughs> it's you know. I don't know. It'd be pretty funny. She laughs a lot. She yeah. laughs a lot. At or with? You don't know. Both. Both. <laughs> so what did you do differently in? Was it more? Was it Mortgage Five Hundred? What? What? Or did you just do the same as you did with Mortgage First? A little bit different in regards to Mortgage First was just about mortgages. We really didn't do anything else. We focused on that. With the Five Hundred Group, as it ended up being, we got specialist in these different areas. So we had done what the bank had tried to do, but they didn't talk to each other. So the financial planner didn't talk to the broker in the bank. It was all very separated. Whereas with the Five Hundred Group, we would all be the specialists. The same business partner as the first diff- business. Different business partner. Um, How did you choose him or her? Um, the first business partner, we were both friends in a similar situation. The second business I started on my own and then I wanted to have the commercial lending side so I went and approached the people that were were basically writing a third of the commercial business for one of the banks. I won't say which one, <laughs> just in case I don't, they're in a Royal Commission. I don't want yeah, to, yes, you yes. know. But, um, yeah, I went and approached the people... Not before time too, by the way. I know, that I thought would be fantastic um, in the business. So I've never hired. I've only ever recruited and approached people I wanted to be in the business. I don't think you've ever fired either. You, you, you never, never lost a staff member. No one in 17 years. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it's that, that, that's probably what I'm most proud of in many ways because that people wanted to be there and they did great. They were all in the top 15% of the industry utilising a lot of these innovative tools that we were doing. What's the best marketing you did in Mortgage 500 outside of putting together a great offering? We did something called an appreciation night. So a lot of people will get referral fees crossing in these types of industries. Hey, give me a property and I'll give you 10000 I hated that. I didn't like that at all. So what we do is, again, this is focusing on the light. The people that supported us, once a year we'd have an appreciation night. So we'd go down to a beautiful winery and we'd put on comedians, of course. Mm. We'd entertain them. And Were, were be- you one of them? I, I am seed, Tim. No doubt. I am seed. But um, what would happen, it'd be a sit-down dinner. Everything else in the industry was always cocktails, come in for a few drinks, come and go as you please. We treated them really well. We entertained them. And we got more business out of those appreciation nights because they were already the people that were supporting us. So we got, we told them, if you weren't here, we don't have a business. Hmm. So we looked after those people and those people looked after us and it was also always a mutual benefit. You sold it in 2015, six years after opening it, for another check of a lifetime? 
Well, I, this was different because I exited this time ah. and this was on the basis of seeing Charlie, my son, jumping on Hastings Street in the, in the ocean there. And, you in know, Noosa? And I had made promises. Was this, a, was this a, vis- a vision that you had? I knew once we had kids that that was always going to be a very strong option. <laughs> <laughs> so you came back to Noosa? Yeah, so I exited at that, at that stage and then I still continued to run... Um, servicing my the clients I wanted to, and then I exited totally out of the industry. Uh, would have been about a year ago now. How's the, the last year been then? You're back, different to last time. Thank goodness. But so did you have a moment of doubt or down? I I still get scared because that time was pretty harrowing. You no know, doubt. So I'm very conscious of it. But I do things differently, like I meditate 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. I take care of myself in that way. I've got projects that I'm working on, so I'm busy and that's important. Projects as in like? Uh, the podcast. Yes. I still do mentoring, but I'll Still do... writing gags? I, yeah, I did. Strangely enough, I was writing gags this morning. Just fun, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I do it because it really helps my creativity and yep. my business thinking. Yep. You sent me a number of sort of philosophical statements or ideas or concepts, and I just want to go through eight of them. I, I, I think you sent me 89 of them, but I could only choose eight. <laughs> so I've called them Life According to Marty. I'm going to read each one out, <laughs> and you are going to provide some short, brief commentary, if that's at all possible. I'll try. Uh, I expect you to make us laugh, rolling in the aisles. Now, the first one is deliver a great experience that you would share with friends. Pretty self-explanatory. Many don't do it, though. Yeah, what are people saying at the barbecue about you and your business? Nice. Do new activities to be the novice in the room and learn new things. Yeah, so I'll do 40-day challenges. Like I did yoga for 40 days, having never done it before, gave up drinking for 40 days, never drank again, <laughs> strange. But, but, but also I did cartooning and that was like, that was strange because all of a sudden my stun, son started drawing. So that was different. Brilliant. And so I do that to be the novice in the room, to be hungry to learn. And again, that just adds upon what I know. So it's more tools in the toolkit. Yeah, open, and opens up probably, I'm going to say, neural pathways that have... It does. Yeah. I don't, even, I don't even know what they are, but I think conceptually it feels, <laughs> feels the right thing to say. We've still got a few, we have. Get to know your team beyond the result you want them to get for the business. Yeah, get to know the person. Mm. Don't, don't just look at the transaction. Don't micromanage. Get to know them, get to know their family, get to know what inspires them. If you know what their life's vision is, you'll get their life's best work. Massive. You don't earn a living, you are living. (laughs) That's my favourite quote because... In the world. Because I thought money would validate me, but I realised that the... and. And really the money, take the dollar sign off and it's just playing sport, right, Mm -hmm. (laughs) with the people you love, you know. I like that. That's how I look (laughs) at it. So I like the game but that's a really important statement because when when I had Charlie I recognised that, you know, you don't, you don't, Earn a living, you are living, you won, you've won. Mm-hmm. You're, here, You're here and you get the choice to do with it what you want. And, yeah, there's challenges in life, but we live in pretty damn good times. Yeah. Set a big blue sky vision, 90-day goals and daily action plans. Yeah, so people have to have a vision to enjoy and they want to believe in someone, they want to believe in a vision and if that's in alignment with them, then they'll come along for the journey. But then you've got to get to work, Tim. You've got to get to work. And then how we bring that down is setting their 90-day goals for what they want to achieve. We had base targets that we'd like to meet, obviously, but they the base targets were three times the industry average. Mm-hmm. So we weren't there to play small. We wanted to play big, but that's how we did it. But then once we had a look at the statistics, we'd move them away and go, now, how do we build a great business? And if people didn't meet Target, we would want to know more so what they're going to do now Mm. to be able to help them and guide them to be able to get where they want to get to. Bring concepts together in new ways from different industries? Yeah, I love that. Uh, That's been my hallmark. But even up here in um, Noosa 10 years ago, I saw a serviced office called the Noosa Boardroom up here, and I thought, this is a great business. This is a really good business. Uh, The numbers stacked up. It was fun. And so I brought that into the mortgage industry, and so we had people, when they were brokers under our banner, they would pay something that they couldn't get anywhere else, so it was a win-win scenario, but we were able to control a 420-square-metre facility with boardrooms and 
you know, the directors didn't pay a cent. Oh, that's clever. So most people, you know, most people pay 40, 50 grand for a premises, but we made sure that everyone won. If they, if those brokers went out there somewhere else, they would be paying double mm. and we gave them the IT and the printers were all there. We covered that. But that was, again, that that's an idea of left field by talking to people in different industries that you can apply into your own that's just magic when it comes and, together. And there are so many learnings we can get from Absolutely. outside of our industry. Andrew Banks again last week in the show made the comment that stop hanging around with people in the same industry as you. Hang around with people who have the same business model as you. Yes, yes. Clever. Thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. How can people hear more about you? What's the podcast called? Yeah, The Marty Vid Show. Clever. And uh, you can subscribe to Dis- uh, Vidsneyland, a happier place on earth. You know, <laughs> the happiest place is taken. But again, that's the same premise. You know, same premise as mortgage firm. Vidsneyland. Vidsneyland. And it's not about Marty, by the way, guys. <laughs> Just remember that. <laughs> Marty, I think we should finish this uh, episode with a one-hour meditation. I've started. Let's go. <laughs> oh, I'm laughing too much. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Good on you, Tim. Well, there you go, team. Marty Vids, I told you it was going to be a masterclass. So many freaking learnings. Fantastic. I love guests like that. Very uh, practical stuff that you can, you should be able to apply like today, certainly tomorrow. By the way, I'll include that video of Seinfeld deconstructing a joke in the show notes over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 429. It is so good if you are interested in kind of honing your humour bone, your humour skills. Before I share my top three attention grabbers from that chat with Marty, if you need some graphic design done, then you are going to love Design Crowd and what they have to offer. Cheap, quick, great. I used to work with a designer who'd forced me to choose two of those three options whenever I wanted something designed. As a small business owner with limited funds, it drove me nuts that I could never have all three. That's why I love Design Crowd. You see, Design Crowd is a website that helps startups, small businesses, and marketers outsource custom design from logos and business cards to websites and landing pages. In fact, Design Crowd gives you access to over 550,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco, ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. Here's how it works you post a brief describing your design need. Within hours, you'll receive your first design, and over the next three to 10 days, a typical project will receive 60 to 100 different designs from designers around the world. You then pick your favourite, make any changes, and pay the designer. You know, whether you're an entrepreneur looking to set up your brand or an established business that needs marketing collateral designed, Design Crowd is your answer. For a special $100 VIP listener offer, go to designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo or enter the discount code Timbo when posting a project. See, now you can have cheap, quick and great design thanks to Design Crowd. Hey, be sure to hang around after my top three attention grabbers as another motivated listener shares a marketing idea that's working for them. And I've got to tell you, this motivated listener didn't like me when he first started listening to the show, but he came around. Plus, this week's advertising jingle of the week is for those of you looking for something light on the fizz that you can slam down fast. Okay, my top three attention grabbers from my chat with Marty Vids. Thanks to our great friends at American Express and at Design Crowd. Attention grabber number one. Look for ways to add humour into your business with your staff, your clients, your suppliers, maybe even yourself. (laughs) Crazy idea. So important to put a smile on people's dials. The world is a tough place. Times are tough, but you can still smile, right? And you can learn more about doing that by listening to episode 208, all the way back, eh, with Troy and Zara, who are my speaking coaches, also fantastic stand-up comedians. I'll put a link in that, uh, of that interview in the show notes. Attention grabber number two, play to the light. Love the idea that there will always be a group of people that love what you have to offer 
those in the light, as Marty puts it. And there will be those that don't love what you have to offer. So tailor your marketing to those that love you. Play to the light. Attention grabber number three, another quote from Marty. Don't ask how you can make more money. Ask how you can be better. I love this. You know, there are many things that link my guests who are all successful small to medium business owners. Um, One of the things is um, they do, they're they're all about constant improvement. They're not sitting there going, how can I make an extra 10 bucks? How can I increase the bottom line by 50% in the next three years? You know, all that kind of stuff. Maybe they're asking that in the back of their mind. I'm sure their accountant is asking that. But surely the better question is asking how can you be better? And then the money follows. That is what grabbed my attention, team. I'd love to know what grabbed yours. Pause now, not right now. Go to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 429. Leave a comment in the show notes and then come back to the show. Okay? You with me? Good. Go. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. All right, you're back. Good, because it is that wonderful time when we get to reward a motivated listener for taking action. To enter, simply send me an email, tim at timreid, R-E-I-D, dot com dot au, telling me one idea you've implemented from listening to this show and what impact it's had on your business. If I read it out on air, you'll receive a prize or three. You go into the draw to win a hot lap in a racing Porsche with past guest and racing car legend Steve Richards. That's valued at two and a half grand. I'll award that at the end of the year. But right now, today's winner is Daniel Monday from dpmtransformation.com. He calls himself a body transformation specialist. Now, Daniel wrote me a very lengthy email, so I've had to do a little bit of an edit and cover off some of the key points that he has learnt. But he starts off with a big bit of a negative. He says, hey, Tim. G'day, Dan. To be honest, when I first started listening, I thought you were a bit full full on. (laughs) A bit full of it too, probably. I tuned in originally after a client mentioned how good it was, so I stuck with it after the first couple of listens. I appreciate that, Daniel. I know I'm not for everyone. That's okay. I'm playing to the light. Back to Dan. Once I got out of my own way, that's a good thing to do. I get in my own way often. I realise that it's actually more enjoyable listening to you with the not-so-serious tone and dad jokes. Good on you, buddy. See? Humour breaks through every time. Dan goes on to say, and I've actually got to thank you because I found your show at a time when I was starting to get a little tired and phoning it in some days. We all get like that, buddy. It was the end of the year, I was tired, hadn't taken a break and was just counting down to the Christmas break, but your podcasts got the ideas flowing again and helped give me a boost in enthusiasm when I needed it most. I am honoured to be able to do that, Daniel, and that's why this podcast exists, mate. If I can inspire, if I can spark some new thinking in you business owners, then I feel like I've had a win. Daniel says, here's what I've crossed off so far in no particular order. Now, I can't share them all because he's cross, he's, he's identified so many things. Um, here they are. Started a document that gets all my ideas written down and then crossed them off as I implement them. I've created separate pages for different locations that I run for the SEO benefit. I've added an FAQ page on my website and filmed a video to answer each one. On that point, I've now been posting more videos to LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, just putting out more helpful content out there. Uh, was inspired by your video episode. Uh, That was with Jules Watkins. Great episode if you're struggling to create video. I'll put a link in the show notes. Added my phone number to my email signature. I know that pisses you off, Timbo. Um, I like this one. Started recycling my content to turn it into a book. In fact, I've got four books planned that's based around recycling my blog posts and other content after one of your guests mentioned it's best to have a series planned. That was Sharon Witt who got the advice from another guest, Dad, um Beaumont, Dale Beaumont, uh, who suggested don't write one book, write a series. Uh, It'll position you much more strongly. Uh, Back to Daniel, emailed old clients who I enjoyed working with to say g'day and see how they were. No pitch, 
Got some business from that. Handed out a letter to each of my clients mentioning and reminding them of my referral program and incentives. Asked clients uh, who subscribe to my daily email. Wow, daily email, that's good. To leave a Google or Facebook review. Got five straight away. And he goes on. He finishes by saying, sorry for the long-winded email. Daniel, do not be sorry, buddy. You are, you are taking action. You are implementing. You're inspiring, buddy. This is fantastic. He says, I want you to know the impact you've had on me and my business in only a short space of time. Thanks very much for what you do, Tim. Cheers, Daniel. And you can find him at dpmtransformation.com. Dan, that is just a solid email, mate, and inspiring because it's all about taking action. For doing that, here is what you have won. You've won a pass to the American Express Lounge at Melbourne or Sydney's International Airport. That's valued at 33 bucks. You have won a limited edition black leather orbit key valued at 50 bucks, thanks to Rex Quo, who was a who is a past guest of this show. A great episode, that one, on crowdfunding. And you have won a backlink on the Small Business Big Marketing website. Well done, buddy. Everyone else, I'd love to know ideas that you've implemented from listening to this show and what impact it's had on your business. Email me, tim at timreid, R-E-I-D, dot com, dot A-U. <laughs> Righto, iron men and women. Remember this jingle from the summer of 1985? You've got to work it hard to be a solo man. You're going to take the lead and make the others follow you. You're going to keep in shape to be a solo man. When you've got a thirst for it, you've got to crack a solo. Extra tangy lemon solo. It's light on fizz for when you're long on thirst. And when you've got I love that ad. Between you and I, my dream was to be a solo man. Big handlebar, mo, the whole look. He kind of looked like, um, wasn't MacGyver? What was that other kind of American sitcom? Can't think right now. But he had a certain look, did the solo man. You can watch that ad over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 429. And if there's a jingle you reckon is worthy of appearing in this segment, then let me know via Twitter at Timbo Reed, R-E-I-D. That almost wraps up another episode of your favourite marketing podcast. I hope it's your favourite. It's Daniel's favourite. Don't forget there is an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Big thanks to American Express for sponsoring this episode. Search Amex Business, that is Amex Business, to find out how your business expenses can reward you, and they absolutely can. And remember, if you need some marketing materials designed for that beautiful business of yours and you don't want to spend a fortune, then check out designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo for $100 off your brief. If you love the Small Business Big Marketing Show, then let another business owner know about it. Please grab their phone, open up the podcast app, search Small Business Marketing. I'll come up, hit subscribe, subscribe to like the most recent 10 episodes for them, hand the phone back, say you're welcome, and run away like some superhero in the night. Until next week, I am Timbo Reed. always have been, always will be. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now. 